Is anyone not running? Alec and I negate the resolution. Our sole contention is trusting the system. Right now, the technology sector is on track for a Cambrian explosion. Bradford Goldstein's 18 of R&D Magazine writes that the recent increases in spending into research and development is driving a tech boom, finding that the 2020s will parallel the massive successes of the 90s in technological innovation. Pichoco's 15 of the American Enterprise Institute finds that the last technological boom in the 90s drove a surge in market capitalism which Kurt of the New York Times quantifies cut unemployment in half through average incomes by 10% and quadrupled stock values. Behind this spending is big tech. As Lowry 19 of Politico explains that the top five spenders in R&D are all big tech companies, as Amazon alone funnels $22 billion a year into innovation. Harvard 19 proves that the innovation spending of tech giants has made tech the fastest growing industry to date. Unfortunately, enforcement of antitrust would derail this boom, shattering innovation in three distinct ways. The first is by reducing risk taking. Ronald Cast 13 of the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy explains that the loose definitions of monopolistic actions give enforcement authorities free reign to persecute whatever they deem as anti competitive. Unfortunately, Cast continues that the tech industry requires expensive investments, which, ant which antitrust authorities block to stop a company's market share growth. He concludes that this constant threat scares companies from innovating newer and cheaper products. For example, Wilcox 11 finds that when courts claim Microsoft violated antitrust law, they ended development of multiple programs and slowed innovation for a decade. But the second reason is through constraining capital. Sharple of the International Center for Law and Economics 18 finds in a 12-year multinational analysis that because R&D is extremely costly, fines from antitrust cases would inherently detract from such spending. In the EU, antitrust fines costed 21.7% of big tech's R&D, stifling long-term innovation. Clyde Crew 16 policy director at the Competitive Enterprise Institute furthers that antitrust court cases force companies to pay for litigation and spend time in court. Cass furthers that an antitrust case against the company IBM in 1969 costed them $5 billion and diverted attention away from development, paralyzing the company. Time is money and antitrust reduces both. But the third is through shocking the market. There's a reason it's called antitrust. The market doesn't trust it. George Fiddlemanger, a distinguished professor of finance at the University of Kansas, explains that the uncertain result of antitrust enforcement breeds fear among investors. Joel Brinkley's UK quantifies that when a court ruled against Microsoft in the year 2000, the Nasdaq dropped 8%, and Howlman of Wired furthers that Microsoft lost $200 billion, and in a snap, after stock value was lost. It's for these three reasons that Fiddlemanger finds that enforcement of antitrust would do nothing more than reduce efficiency, investment, and growth. The impact is halting technological development. Maintaining current innovation is key. As Tammy 18 of Forbes magazine writes that the upcoming technological boom will generate enough wealth to dwarf even the United States debt. This will spur real benefits for the American consumer. As Rosie 18 quantifies that technology jobs are currently growing by 200,000 every year and are on track to reach 1.2 million. Conversely, Middle Mayor finds that antitrust enforcement coincided with market crashes in 1907, 1911, the 1920s, 1930s, um, 37 and 1962. But the cycle didn't end in 1962. As Brian McCall 18 explains, that when courts ruled against Microsoft in the 2000 antitrust case, the market drove downwards and crashed. 100 million investors lost $5 trillion. 70% of 401ks lost significant value, and Silicon Valley alone lost 200,000 jobs. Don't repeat <coughs> the mistakes of the past. Well, join me on the negation. dream is dead. Samuel Himmel of Competition Policy International explains that monopolies such as Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon are less likely to support innovations, especially those that create entirely new markets because they want to maintain their positions of power. As a result, even when these companies have ample resources, they will not fully utilize them, creating what economists call dead weight loss, or a loss in potential economic output. Derek Thompson, 16 of the Atlantic, confirms that as the tech industry has become more monopolistic, innovation, entrepreneurship, and productivity on the whole have come to a grinding halt. Specifically, the tech giants are killing innovation in two key areas. First is patent paranoia. 
While patents were intended to reward innovators for new ideas, they are now used as weapons to block out competitors. Robert Reich, 15 of the New York Times, explains that big tech companies have bought thousands of patents for ideas that they hardly ever use so that other companies have to wait years before acts having access to those brilliant ideas. In fact, The Economist 15 reports that up to 90% of these big tech patents are never used or licensed out by their owners. For example, Ben Rossi, 15 of the Information Age, writes that Google's overly broad patents right now could jeopardize the future of artificial intelligence innovation for smaller companies and the industry as a whole. Fortunately, enforcing antitrust regulation would solve this by putting patents in the hands of startups who would actually implement the ideas. Because big tech's abuse of the patent system is exclusionary to smaller businesses, the government can regulate it through antitrust enforcement. Thomas Catan, 11 of the Wall Street Journal, reports that the Justice Department has expressed interest in using antitrust to address big tech's abuse of the patent system. Putting ideas into the hands of millions of small companies would unleash innovation. Fox EU quantifies that in the first five years after AT&T was required to license its patents for free, innovation increased 25% and continued to increase thereafter. The second way is data domination. In the digital age, companies need data to succeed. It helps businesses understand the latest trends to optimize product products for the American consumer. Unfortunately, this crucial resource is anti-competitively hidden by a handful of CEOs. Thomas Range, 18 of Foreign Affairs, explains that although a huge amount of data on consumers is collected, it remains underused because only a few firms have access to it. This phenomenon is explained by econ economist Robert Rogers, who finds that the concentration of crucial resources in a few companies holds back overall technological progress. Because big tech's monopoly control over consumer data prevents a more competitive market, Competition Policy International 19 concludes that the government has historically used antitrust enforcement to ensure that companies share data with hardworking entrepreneurs. <coughs> For example, Range explains that in 2011, the Justice Department forced Google to offer its competitors access to data in the online reservation industry. Giving companies access to data would dramatic, dr dramatically boost innovation. The Digital Competition Expert Panel explains in 2019 that access to data enables companies to innovate more because data gives them increased ability to predict trends in the market and specially tailor their products to the consumers. This is crucial as Merges concludes that giving data to smaller companies would generate a much more diverse set of innovations than when development is just controlled by a, a few companies. Thus, they quantify that access to data increases productivity growth by 10%. The overall impact is revitalizing the American economy. As a result of big tech's abusive practices, CNN 18 quantifies that entrepreneurship is at a 40-year low. Fortunately, and Chief Trust has historically worked. Joseph Clarity of the Journal of the Economics of Business quantifies that every standard deviation increase in a country's commitment to antitrust increases economic growth by 0.84%. Thus, The Economist finds that a 1% increase in economic growth creates 1 million jobs, allowing for a revival of the American dream. I see two pieces of evidence. Sure. One, few firms having access to these crucial resources, and second, that antitrust opens up data, or opens up data to everyone. Okay, so, the, <coughs> so you want that only a few firms have access to data, no. and then you want the antitrust solves. Mm -hmm. okay.
44 seconds. Ready for cross examination? As the first speaking team, I take the first question. Go ahead. We'll start now. So let's talk about your second warrant on data collection. Let's talk about the protection of consumers' data. Now let's compare small firms' ability to protect our data as compared to big firms. Okay, so the way the data argument happens is the firms that collect the data, the big firms, give it to the government, the government anonymizes the data, and then it goes to the small firms. So there's no problem with like protecting the data because there's no names or addresses linked to it. Can so I ask you a question? Really quickly, can we talk about this data? What are we actually collecting? What's vital to increase companies' innovation? Okay, like if companies don't know like what products are being bought on Amazon.com most often, or like what things are being searched on Google most often, it's hard for them to know what people want. Can't so, I just look at the consumer report and see what's most bought and what people look to most for a good product? Okay, the problem is like Google, not like they don't just collect those small things. They collect what like vast amounts of data, like through Google Maps, through email, like things so like that. Give people can I ask you people access to where people are located in Google Maps? No, like where people, what restaurants people are going to, what those restaurants sell, things like that. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay, so let's talk about this whole idea about like constraining capital. Would you agree that uh, big techs or big tech companies like generally have parts of their firm that are specific for like controlling lawsuits? So like in the event of a lawsuit, those parts of the firm would do that part, but the rest of the firm would still like do their work. We're talking specifically about amount, the amount of capital that they have. And when looking to the EU, the massive amount of antitrust fines stopped 21.7% of their innovation, regardless or not if they I'm asking about the specific other sector part. allocated to it, it doesn't matter. Big tech, unfortunately, doesn't have you, unlimited money. You gave like two parts to your warrant. You said first, there's high costs, but second, it distracts the company. But if the company is a specific part of the company that's job is to do lawsuits, how are the engineers distracted? Well, they're probably going to be distracted by the fact that the entire company is being hurt because their stock values are going down. That can okay. change the entire way that Why does that operates. distract an engineer who is just producing in a lab? Why does he care what's going on in the lawsuit? If I'm an engineer and I see that my company is about to go down the toilet, I'd probably oh. be a bit concerned. You might be looking I would probably problem. start doing better so that my company's ratings would go up. I would try to produce better products. That's contestable. But sure, but like, question? we're seeing that like it's not very logical to assume that just because the lawyers of the firm are having more work, that means the engineers well, I mean, of the firm are just going to give up example. and be like, hey, I'll pretend to be a so lawyer. Let's turn empirical example. When Microsoft got ruled against in 1994, we saw their innovation go down. They stopped development in places like Microsoft Office and Internet Explorer. So if what you're saying is true and engineers just decide it's time to work when they get ruled against, why did Microsoft lose their innovation for a decade? Wait, okay. You're giving like two different examples about Microsoft. The one you talked about in case was the 2000 case. No, I talked about two examples. Okay, sure. So can you ask your question again? Sorry. So if what you're saying is true and engineers start developing more when they get ruled against with antitrust, why did Microsoft stop innovating for a decade? Like I'm just giving a possible outcome. I would say that it's I'm like, saying it's, it's, it, it's very unreasonable to say that these innovators, these people who do totally other things are That's just going to be like, okay. This is going to be going down there, case. Okay, so time, I'm going to wait on the bottom. Okay. Caption ready? Yes. Comments ready. Most importantly, judges ready. Starts off with an overview on this case. Let's start off with an overview. There are two reasons startups would never fill the innovative hole of big tech. First, they don't have the capital necessary to invest money into newer technologies and even existing technologies such as AI, the Internet of Things, self-driving cars, and 5G. But second and most importantly, they can't afford the risk. If a small company fails in an R&D project, that's it. The company is dead. But big tech companies can fail in R&D projects and continue to exist. That's why Google failed with Google Glass and continued to innovate. If Google Glass was a smaller company, the smaller company would have died off. With that, they tell you that um, big tech Tech is not focusing on any new markets. Yeah, that's because there are not new markets to focus on. AI already exists in its fundamentals. Same with the Internet of Things. Same with every single type of phone, computer, and internet service. If these small businesses are focusing more on new technologies, I'd argue that's what leads to a halt in innovation because then it takes years to find what new technologies they're trying to create. Meanwhile, big tech focuses on the products we have right now and make it better. That's the cleanest link over to consumers. But then they tell you that we're leading to an innovation halt because there's no attempt to innovate. That's not true. Two reasons. First, they themselves tell you that innovation leads to an increase in 
using product selling, it leads to cheaper goods as well. That means that big tech innovating gets them more money. That's why they're innovating right now. But second, there is competition. Google competes with Tesla for self-driving cars. Facebook competes with Twitter and Snapchat. Apple competes with Microsoft and Samsung for the phone and computer industry. They clearly have an incentive to innovate. That's why PhD and Nathan McCullough broke into institute finds in 2018 that when accounting for the diminishing number of small businesses, the United States leads the world in growing the innovation and the Boston Consulting Group finds in 2018 that the nine most innovative companies in the world are all big tech companies. But then, off the top, there's also a giant problem with their entire case. Pembury 19 finds that as long as a monopoly exists, investors will never invest into tech startups because they will fear competing against a monopoly. Even if you get rid of patent hoarding and data hoarding, you never get rid of the existence of the monopoly in the first place, I meaning venture capitalists are always deterred and tech startups fail because of funding. With that, go to the first thing about fat patents. Five responses. One, what Singer 17 of Gale finds that the only historical example of a company being forced to give out patents was in 1956 with AT&T, but two years later, the FTC regret that decision and they have not done it since. Sukum's gonna come up here and read to a ton of other things that have happened, but that's not true. Call every single piece of evidence. What those times happen is that the FCC and the DOJ force companies to charge the patents for lower prices, but they tell you that 90% of patents are not, not are not being licensed out right now, meaning it doesn't matter how, how cheap these patents are forcibly being sold, they are not being licensed in the first place. Second and most importantly, Skill Core 19 of Inc. finds that in order for the government to sue a company for patent hoarding, they already have to be using that patent in the first place, meaning there's no new patents that enter the market. Third, Gartenberg 19 finds that the Open Innovation Network is a network that includes Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft, in which they already open source patents. Sukum's going to tell you that Google's only given out 10, but Microsoft already gave out 60,000 patents, considering that they have some overlap in technological industries, companies already have access to the patents. But most importantly, David finds that Google and Facebook already open sourced all of their patents for AI, but we still don't see AI booming showing that small companies do not have an do not have an intent to use any of these patents. But then Giant turn here. If companies cannot patent any of their innovation, their incentive to innovate goes away. And most importantly, if everyone's working on the same tech, that's not diverse technology. And then on data. One, they never really explain to you why data is necessary for innovation, considering that small companies can already focus on market trends right now. Second, and most importantly, their own evidence that like newspaper they give you says that big tech then also gets access to small tech's market trends and small tech's data as well, meaning that at the end of the day, it's a trade-off in both worlds. Big tech can still kill small tech with their own information. But then third and most importantly, they never actually explain it to you what is specific data comes out of this. Even if companies can focus more on market trends, that doesn't lead to a diversification of innovation. That leads to a simplification of innovation because now everybody is focusing on the same market trends. Then, go to their impact. One, Vinnemeyer finds that in historically antitrust intervention has decreased investor confidence and they find that every single antitrust, inter antitrust intervention decreases investor confidence and the stock value of a company by 1.2%, which is by 1907, 1911, 1962, the 1920s, end of the year 2000, antitrust intervention correlated with market crashes. But second, most Importantly, McEwen Tia Forbes that finds that Amazon is donating a billion dollars to small businesses every single year. The moment you paralyze these companies, you hurt the small companies that relies on big tech as well. Respond to their rebuttal first and then respond to their case. Is everyone ready? Okay. So let's start in their overview that startups don't matter. What the CPI explains that startups are responsible for three fourths of all job creation and the bulk of innovation, and it's more, most importantly, the bulk of the economic value generated by innovation. And so far, it doesn't cite any cards or any statistics for this. The fact that we give you a statistic means that small businesses do create innovation. Also, it just logically makes sense. That he says that big tech always innovates and that they get money and for in from innovation and they have a co they have a competitive necessity to innovate. This delinks their first fort in their case because it means that big tech always has a competitive and financial necessity to innovate 
regardless of the risk of antitrust. Let's go. So I'm, we're uh, then they say like America is more innovative than other countries. This is just a general blanket statement. No like evidence about antitrust. You pen controls for other factors and finds that when you actually control for other factors, sectors in Europe that have more antitrust enforcement see higher productivity growth, which means America is actually falling behind because we don't enforce antitrust. Then they say that no matter what, we're never they're never going to invest in small businesses because it's always going to be monopoly. But if we win our argument about, about data, we also solve for the monopoly because what the act of foreign affairs evidence says is the reason why big tech is has a irreplaceable monopoly is because they have all the consumer data so they can pr predict any trends in the market and kill the trend before it even like comes into fruition so if we force them to share the data with smaller companies small companies can also like use the data which means that we solve back for their like, quote unquote irreversible monopoly let's go to our second word about data the responses are like really not responsive first of all they say that like we don't give you a warrant but um we tell you that when small businesses have access to data they can better predict trends in the market so they can better tailor their products to benefit consumers and also like they this is also like with no evidence our empiric says that giving data to firms increases productivity growth by 10 percent automatically defer to us because we would actually give you an empiric then he says that big tech would also give small tech data that like our article in this like journal is talking about a different thing called progressive data sharing where everyone gets everyone's data specifically in antitrust we'd force big companies to give the data to small companies because that like makes sense that's the anti-competitive thing small companies are not being anti-competitive because they don't even have any data in the first place then they classify their market crash argument. I'll get to this on their case. So let's move on to their case. At the top of their case, they said like there's going to be a tech boom. Three responses. First of all, investors have been predicting a tech tech boom for so long, but it's never happened. Our Atlantic evidence that they drop says that productivity has been declining for decades. They don't give you any reason why it's suddenly going to turn into a boom. But second of all, just because the going is good doesn't mean we should become complacent. It can always get better in our world. But third, we think that the tech boom is being driven by things like 5G, which aren't attributable to big tech. They're attributable to other countries like other companies like Qualcomm who are investing in 5G. It has nothing to do with big tech. Let's go to the board. The first one is less risk taking. First of all, he contradicted in his rebuttal, but second of all, we've already we've already used antitrust to force companies to share data in the past, which means the precedent has already been set. There's no new uncertainty that comes from voting pro. And their second word about less spending, three responses here. First of all, Business Insider explains that companies like Google have already set out separate budgets for antitrust, which means they wouldn't detract out of R&D. They've already set out the money from the, to, to the side. Second of all, when they give you the example of Microsoft, two responses here. First of all, the reason Microsoft stopped innovating was not because of antitrust, it was because they were literally irrelevant. What the AEI explains is that um, Microsoft would put all their investments into PC computers while the world was switching towards mobile devices, so they literally lost all their revenue. That's why they stopped innovating. But this also disproves, like, uh, this also, uh, uh, yeah. And then second of all, um, when we, and force antitrust on companies like Microsoft to give smaller companies more breathing room because it decreases their anti-competitive practices, which is why Harvard finds the Microsoft antitrust case led to the rise of Facebook and Google, which has much more economic benefits than just Microsoft's innovation. But third, engineers aren't the people who are being like in court cases, so obviously they wouldn't stop innovating just because there's a lawsuit. On their third argument about stock market crashes, two responses. First of all, LSU explains that after an antitrust case, the value of stock comp uh, the value of the stock recovers within one year, so it's ex extremely short term. The second of all, CNN explains that a stock crash is not the same thing as a recession. For example, stocks crashed in December of 2018, but the economy kept growing. Their example of Microsoft is flawed because it, their evidence does say it caused a stock crash, but it doesn't say it caused a recession. The New York Times explains the reason why it caused a recession was because of the Fed hiked interest rates in 2000. Also, their other evidence from Midland Meyer is very correlative. For example, it says antitrust caused the Great Depression, which obviously isn't true. Okay. I'm going to take a question. Yeah. So when in the year 2000 did the Fed hike the interest rate? Uh, I'm not sure. So how do we know it didn't come right after the Microsoft case, which oh. was earlier in the year? So okay, so here's here's why we know one caused it and, and you one did. So historically, the like Fed interest rate hikes have always preceded recessions. For example, the Fed hiked interest rates before the 2008 recession. The hiked before the 2000. Uh, the 2000 recession, it, like Fed policy errors have caused, caused recessions in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Isn't the Fed so really like, interest rates right now? Uh, no, actually, the like the head, the, this is really irrelevant. But the head of the or the Fed chair or whatever his name is, he like said that he that they're going to be dovish about interest rates and they're not going to hike them. But re regardless, right, that we're kind of straying away from the point. Your evidence says, and the the Bitling Meyer evidence. The business insider evidence about Microsoft, all of it says that it caused stock <coughs> crashes. But in my rebuttal, I say there's a difference between a stock crash and a recession. For example, yeah. the Nasdaq dropped by a huge amount this December in 2018, but the economy kept growing. Right. So there's a difference between a stock crash and a recession. Our evidence, the, the, what, 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 why we should prefer our evidence? Our evidence is because Fed this, interest this rates. This has been going on for like 45 seconds. Are you going to ask a question? Oh, 
was entering yours. Oh, okay. But if that was true, then why did the Nasdaq drop 75% before the economic implications of a Fed hike ever took place? Oh, again, I told you this. A stock crash is different than a recession, right? No, the I'm stock, aware, but why the did the Nasdaq market... drop 75% before any economic implication of a Fed hike? So, for, first of all, it recovered within one year, but second of all, like there's no impact of a stock Wait, market crash. The if stocks it, recovered, but if things like jobs and 401ks no, all of a sudden no, were so, so that was So those were from the recession, which was caused by Fed interest rates. Wait, then why were the impacts isolated on tech? It was 200,000 no. jobs lost in okay. Silicon Valley. Okay, okay, the reason why is because there was a bubble in the tech sector, and when the Fed hiked interest rates, it popped the tech bubble. But how does hiking, I, I mean, sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, well, the reason why is because when you hike interest rates, it becomes more expensive to borrow money, so it depresses consumer spending, which generally pops I mean, bubbles. Can I ask you a question? from now? the government, but sure. Or also from And me. you can ask a question. Oh, yeah, can I ask you a question? Oh, sure. So, um, you, when you say that America is like more innovative than other company, other countries, does this evidence talk about antitrust at all, or is it just a general kind of piece of evidence? It's a general piece of evidence talking okay, so about then, new technologies. Right, sure. Then why should we prefer that over our evidence that actually isolates for other factors and concludes that antitrust has has made other countries, like especially those in Europe, more productive than America? Because your evidence probably doesn't take into account the actual commercialization of products. We'd say, sure, maybe small businesses create more products. We'd say they never actually get them to the consumers, which is right, why small businesses are creating products right, right now, that's... but everyone in this room is using a computer okay. from Big Tech. Wait, right, sure, right? But the evidence like, specifically says that productivity growth, which are like actual macroeconomic factors well, that I mean, everyone in this room were higher when we had antitrust. Wait, so like what impacts people more? Something like a cheaper product or Silicon Valley is more economic growth? I see that it's not antitrust which caused the recession in 2001. Yeah. Or the one with the Fed hike? Yeah. If you want more context, I can play this for you. It's 46 seconds so far. Time starts back up now.
enforced our antitrust case against Microsoft in the year 2000, it caused the market to crash. We explained to you that this caused a couple implications. First, it caused 70% of 401 keys to lose significant value. Second, it caused 100 million investors to lose $5 trillion. And third, it caused 200,000 jobs to be taken from Silicon Valley. This is people losing their jobs. They read you a few responses to this. First, they say the stock values recover. Yes, but the 200,000 people didn't get their jobs back. Stock values don't cover the real implications we see on the economy and the people working in the tech sector. But second, they say a stock crash does not equal a recession. Our Biddlemeyer evidence is very specific in saying that antitrust regulations generally correlate with st both stock market crashes and recession. This is why we're seeing the implications that happen in 07, 11, um, 1907, 1911, the 1920s, 1937, and 1962. We've called for their evidence in which they say that the it was interest rate hikes from the Fed which caused the um, 2000 recession to happen. It said it's what caused the recession to be at the peak, not what necessarily popped the bubble. We tell you it's antitrust cases that popped the bubble and caused it all to happen in the first place. With that, let's go on to their case. First, on the overview that we read to you on, much, on why startups won't be able to innovate as much as big tech, all they say is that startups cause three-fourths of the uh, job creation to happen. First, this isn't specific to the tech sector, but second, the tech sector is different because it costs a lot of money to be able to, in order to innovate in the tech sector. Look to our first one, which we tell you that innovating big tech is incredibly expensive and going to places like AI and, in, and 5G, like they explained to you. But second, they cannot recover from the risk. At that point, when they say small businesses are going to be solving for their impacts, don't buy it. With that, um, extend the um, go to their second point. Extend the fact that we never see a specification of what data we're going to be seeing released. Small companies already right now can see what tr market trends are happening in their field. Therefore, we're, we're not going to see any real implication. Also, extend the response in which we say that we're also going to be releasing data for both small businesses and large businesses. They try and frontline out of this by saying we're only going to do it for big businesses. They don't give you a piece of evidence. We need to look to their own evidence that they actually give you which says when we release data is of both small businesses and big businesses. They say data is what allows people to have monopolies. No, it's the fact that they have market share and market dominance which allows them to just beat out smaller competition. We used 47, we'll run the majority of that. Right was one time so we Drop their first and second warrants, don't weigh them. Let's go to their third warrant. Remember, we tell you that stock crashes don't necessarily mean recessions. They're, they say that their evidence says that it correlates with a recession. Call for their evidence, they're blatantly lying about it. We have it on our computer right now. All it says is that it, uh, that it correlates with lower stock prices. It doesn't lead to a recession. What actually led to the 2000 recession that they're talking, or the 2000.com bust that they're talking about from our New York Times evidence was the Fed hiked interest rates. They sit, try to indict our evidence. Their indict makes no sense. Our evidence is way cleaner than theirs. Please call for all the cards. You're, if you do, you'll clearly vote for us. 
Now let's go to our case. On top of our case, <coughs> they make their overview, and we tell you from the CPI that startups are responsible for three-fourths of job creation. They say that there's high fixed costs in the tech industry, so startups can't do it. But when the startups don't have to focus on getting patents or getting data, they can focus on doing this innovation, they can focus on paying those high fixed costs, and then they can go and do that. They clean drop the evidence from Thompson of the Atlantic who explains that as tech becomes more monopolized, innovation, entrepreneurship, and productivity have come to a grinding halt. They don't respond to it in summary, don't let Alec respond to it in his final focus. Now let's go to our argument about data. They make two responses. First they say, we don't say what data is released. The data that is released is data about what consumers like, how they can better predict market trends. That is what is released. And then their second response is that it also releases small businesses data. Think about this log logically, Judge. If there is an antitrust case against Google that rules that Google has to share their data, why would a small business also have to share their data? They misinterpreted our card. Our card just says the big business that the antitrust case is against, they have to share the data to small businesses. That's why right now, only a few CEOs control all the data in the tech industry. If you make those CEOs share that data to small businesses, they will boom. Because we tell you that giving data to more companies would increase productivity growth by 10% because they can better, better predict trends in the market and tailor their products to consumers. That's why you see a 1% increase in economic or productivity growth creates 1 million jobs the clearest impact of today's round. You can always weigh arguments over theirs because recessions are short term, but if you make small businesses permanently more innovative, that means the economy is permanently helped, we have permanent impacts, theirs will go away in two or three years. That's why you should affirm. Get ready for cross-examination. Yeah. So let's talk about your warrant on data collection. You say that it's data that shows what consumers actually like that's going to help people to innovate. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a small business and I figure out that people like, for instance, apps with fruit in them, how is that going to help me innovate anything? Okay, so first of all, like all warrants, is not innovate before we even get into the warrant today. You've conceded your evidence throughout the round. I'd like to understand your evidence. <coughs> before, I was, okay, before that, right? You conceded the evidence throughout the round that when firms have access to data, they're 10% more productive. So before we even try to discuss the logic, right off the bat, the numbers are in our favor. The way the debate works, in order to access the numbers at the bottom of your case, you right. need to win the warrant. Sure. So let's talk about the warrant. Okay, yeah. so the second of all, right? If a company is making, for example, AI, okay? AI needs an input of data for it to work in the first place, right? So it's the data <coughs> that makes it from AI, which is like what consumers like, that's gonna power the AI development. Right, so like AI, the way AI works is it's a neural network, right? So it needs some input to train it for how it works. So right now, only the big tech companies have access to so all this data. Wait, but do small businesses have the AI to train in the first place? Right, so uh, right now, right, so, so what Nate tells you in a summary is that if they weren't so busy trying to get all the patents and data from big tech companies, they'd be able to redirect that efforts into okay. like well, overcoming but you guys the high see fixed all the dealings from with patents, though, right? Or sure. Then if they weren't so busy focusing on trying to get data, so small businesses right now are focusing more on trying to get data than actually innovating. Right, because it, the prerequisite. So how do you have evidence that they're really innovative? So, uh, for, so that's talking about small businesses in general. But anyway, right, the prerequisite to being able to innovate is having data. So, in, so obviously, right, they're not innovating that much because they don't have the data in the first place. Okay. Okay. Yeah, how how like, how can we have two minutes on this? Can we have a small business that didn't have access to the data that's being Wait, claimed? I'll spend two minutes on this, and you've asked three questions. Can we ask your one? Guys just being sure. Try again. Okay. So let's talk about your argument about shocking the market. Mm -hmm. Why does a market getting shocked inherently mean that a recession follows? We, I mean, like, so well, I'll, I'll actually point to you directly from the evidence. The, two, the 1911 and 1912 recession. Wait, read the sentence before the, the, those two examples. It says, no, there's we're not talking about a growing body of evidence. evidence. We're talking about that yeah. part. So, that's the, right, so you when, say our part of the evidence only talks about stock market crashes. Can yeah. I read you a part that talks about recession? It says, the, there's a growing body of evidence that trust busting hurts stock prices, and then the list of examples that you that you read okay. follow that sentence. The issue which is that, those are that all is only a separate stock. part of the argument. We're talking about Upper in his study where he talks about past recessions caused by trust busting. Okay. The more, and the 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 can just you fall. read your evidence out loud for us right now that Fed hikes is what caused the recession? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her, her. The dot com bubble peaked in 2000 after the Federal Reserve had increased interest rates multiple times. So where does it say that it start, right? Huh? Sorry? Where does it say that it popped the bubble? So. With the, double, the bubble peaks, that implies that it only goes downwards after the event, right? No, it doesn't say the Fed hike is what caused that peak to never continue to grow. Okay, and your evidence yeah. doesn't say that it happened when we do that. It's going to be their case and then back over to our case. Everyone ready? Let's 
start off at the top of their case. They tell you that companies are, don't have a lot of money right now because they're focused on getting things like data. This does not really make sense. And it doesn't interact with the argument just makes sense. It doesn't matter where their money is going to right now. The argument that we made in every speech and that Sukum is not allowed to respond to in the second final focus is that small businesses in general do not have the amount of money necessary to develop products and then commercialize them. Meaning at the end of the day, all of the productivity goes to waste in the long term because innovation is not infinite, meaning all of their impacts are short term. Our impacts are not one time recessions, which shots back against Nate Twain because the recession is caused by a single antitrust enforcement. But when you have continuous antitrust enforcement, that's many stock market crashes happening on continuous times. With that, let's go now to their data argument anyway. They tell you that they get to understand what consumers like. One, they don't accept the link in summary as to how that leads to increased productivity. They just tell you that leads to adaption to the market. But second and most importantly, they also drop that anyone could just look at the market right now and look at market trends and determine what people want. Getting more specific doesn't trigger their impacts. They tell you it's black and white. We'd argue it's scalar, considering that none of these arguments have been addressed. Let's go to the only other thing in the round. What they extend is that a crash is not a recession. That does not matter. Our evidence tells you that it's the stock market meltdown, the stock market crash, which triggered all of our impacts. Then they tell you that the Fed hikes is what caused to pop the bubble. That's not true. The Fed hikes correlated with the Microsoft case. And at that point, the Fed hike allowed the bubble to grow, but it's not what caused the bubble to pop. Roosevelt explains that the day courts ruled against Microsoft, they turned market ties. The Nasdaq dropped 75% within a week, and that is what actually popped the bubble. 70% of 401k lost significant, significant value. 100 million investors lost $5 trillion, and Silicon Valley alone lost 200,000 jobs. That always against their entire case because if the economy crashes, A, investor confidence goes away, they're not going to invest in smaller businesses, but second, most importantly, overall economic output goes down, meaning small businesses are never going to get the money necessary to invest in big tech, to invest in innovation, and big tech also does not have that money, meaning at the end of the day, shocking the market on a continuous scale with every single enforcement causes a much larger impact than one-time innovation. make a new response and final focus to the CNN evidence that we've been studying in every single speech in the round, which is that a stock crash is not the same thing as a recession, right? The actual thing that kills jobs and increases poverty and costs investors money is the recession, not the stock market crash. My opponents don't respond to this until, until, until the final focus. All their evidence, including the Microsoft example and their Bitline, Bitline market evidence, are all talking about stock market crashes. The only example they give of a recession is the Microsoft case, but our evidence in the New York Times says that the, two, the reason why the, the Microsoft case led, or why there was a recession in 2000 was because of the Fed hiking interest rates. Our evidence is pretty good about this. My opponents, again, they just continue to assert that it was because of like um, it was because of the antitrust case. But remember, their evidence is only talking about stock prices, not the actual recession. The actual thing that has impacts on the ground, thing that's hurt small businesses, and actual the actual people on the ground is a recession, which means that they don't link it to any of their impacts. Also remember that they're only affecting to one recession since the, the scope of the resolution is just the technology giants, which means that voting pro means one recession, not this continual scope of like recessions that happen in the long term. Again, that's a new response and final focus. Let's go to our case. They say that small businesses can't commercialize, commercialize products. Again, this is an assertion. They don't cite any evidence for this. Our evidence from the CPI says that small businesses are, are responsible for three-fourths of job creation and the bulk of innovation, which shows that empirically, if you look at the actual like, historical evidence, small businesses are capable and have innovated in the past. We, our argument right now in our second warrant is that because they don't have access to data, they physically can't innovate because they can't predict trends in the market. My opponent did a couple of responses to this. First of all, they, they, like, we don't know what data. Our argument is that right now, big tech companies have actual, access to all the data on what consumers want and what consumers want to buy and trends in the market. Small companies do not have access to this data, and our evidence is very explicit about that. Keep in mind that we have evidence on this claim, and they just assert it. And that means that in, in, in their world, small businesses cannot predict trends in the market. In our world, you force companies to share the data, which means they can properly predict trends in the market, which increases productivity by 10%. At that point, looking for impact from The Economist, that when small businesses innovate more, every 1% increase in productivity creates 1 million jobs in the long term. At the end of the day, our impacts are a permanent increase in productivity. Theirs is one stock market crush. For all these reasons, please vote for us.